Hello and a warm welcome to this webinar about IFRS 16 in the public sector. My name is Carl and I work for House Control as a CSM and technical uh, consultant and I'm joined here today by Daniel Stewart, OBE from RSF. Hi, as Carl says, I'm Danielle Stewart and I'm a partner in a large firm of chartered accountants, RSM, where I specialise in advising clients on complex financial reporting. Um, to kind of back that up, I've always got involved in the regulatory side of the accountancy profession. And in that context, I've been on all sorts of committees and boards and panels, mostly writing accounting standards, also writing company law, and from time to time advising the government on various things. Um, in this context, I'm interested not just in the application of IFRS 16, but also how the regulators will view it. Sounds great. And yes, yeah, so like I said, we're doing a presentation on public sector and IFRS 16, so I think you can just jump straight to it. Okay, so looking at the um, agenda for today, we're going to start by looking at how IFRS 16 works, kind of regardless of the public sector. Then we'll take it down to the specifics of how it impacts on public sector entities um, before taking a quick look at when it's applying. And finally, of course, how we can help you. So the impact of IFRS 16. You can see here on the five uh, blocks that I've got on the slide that we're just going to take a very quick look at how it works. So what's it all about? Well, you know, if you rent something, you have a rent charge that goes in your statement of net expenditure and you don't have anything on the balance sheet unless you happen to owe some money at a particular point in time for, for, for not having paid your rent or more likely have a, a prepayment. Well, under IFRS 16, all of that is a thing of the past. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to recognise a liability on your statement of financial position for the lease payments you're going to make, even though this is a rental agreement, not a finance lease, and you're also going to have to have an asset on the balance sheet. Now, how can that work? Because there's no asset, we're not actually buying anything. Well, the way that you do it is, if you remember finance leases, what you do with a finance lease is even though it looks like a lease, you just make payments each month or quarter, you would capitalise the effect of that finance lease as though it was a higher purchase agreement. Okay? And what we're going to do with IFRS 16 is pretty much exactly that. You're going to take a look at what are the payments we're making over time, how much interest is effectively included in there, and you're going to break out the liability and the asset. Now we'll talk in a minute about how we actually get to those figures, but what we end up with is a lease liability, which is the payments you're going to make over the life of the lease, and a right of use asset, which is, if you like, a kind of representative sort of conceptual asset that is your right to use the photocopier or building or whatever it is. Um, the rent that would have gone through your statement of net expenditure is no more that figure doesn't exist. Instead, what you have is a depreciation charge or an amortisation charge on the right of use asset, exactly like you would do if it was a, an owned asset. And you also then have a notional interest charge in the statement of net expenditure. And over time, those will add up to be the same amount as the rent, but the profile of them hitting the PL, as it were, will be different. There are a couple of exemptions for low value and short life leases. We'll talk about them in a minute in a bit more detail. And the one thing that stays exactly the same, I would say in the public sector, it's pretty unlikely that this will apply to you. But if you happen to be a lessor, i.e. you're renting something out, the requirements are identical, pretty much identical. So moving on, how do we calculate the lease liability? What do we recognise? So we start with working out the present value of the minimum lease payments. Now, an important thing here to think about is what are the minimum lease payments? How many are you going to pay? And if you've got, if we just take a building because that's the easiest one to think about for a minute. If you've got a lease that is 10 year lease, but maybe after five years, there's a break clause. And that break clause is at the option of you as the lessee, okay? What you do is very unusually for accounting standards, you ask yourself, am I going to take up that option to extend this lease? Do I think I'm going to stay there 10 years? 
And if you do think you're going to stay there the full 10 years, you recognise 10 years' worth of lease payments in your liability. If you kind of know that after five years you want to get out, or it's more likely than not that maybe you're going to need to relocate or, or the entity is growing, so you'll want to get out after five years, you would only recognise five years' worth. So it's really management intent comes into it very strongly. So you do a kind of present value calculation, and for that you need to know a discount rate, okay, like an interest rate. You know, you do one of those little spreadsheets where you put the payments in and then you put in a sort of notional interest and work out the capital and it all comes down to zero at the end. You've got to have an interest rate for doing that, right? Well, in the public sector, you're very lucky because whereas in the private sector, this has caused all sorts of trouble, the government have very kindly given you a rate that you can use, which we'll talk about in more detail a, a little bit later. So you work out the present value, the net present value of your minimum lease payments, and to that you add the present value of any, any expected payments at the end of the lease. What am I talking about? Well, anyone that's ever rented a car or leased a car will remember that at the end of the lease you often have a sort of bubble payment where you know, you've been paying £500 a month, but then at the end you suddenly have to pay £5,000 to actually get to own the car. You would add that end payment on in arriving at your lease liability. In other words, it's whatever you're going to pay out. And that gives you your lease liability. OK, now we've got to end up with an asset as well. And how do we do that? Well, like I mentioned at the beginning, you start by taking the liability, the lease liability you've just worked out. So you can see these first two bubbles are basically the exact same things you had on the previous screen. But to that, we add a number of things. The initial direct costs. These are costs that are incremental to this particular asset, whatever it is. So most likely something like legal fees, or if you're talking about a property, if you've paid somebody to find a lease for you generally, you won't include those. But if you've paid somebody to, say, negotiate the rent on this particular property, those would be added on. Prepaid lease payments speak for themselves, probably haven't got any, but if you have, you'd add them into the right of use asset. And then a bit of a difficult one, this cost to dismantle, remove or restore, um, also known as reinstatement costs. This is not dilapidations, okay? Dilapidations, you do exactly like you always did. You make a, a provision in the statement of financial position by making a charge to the statement of net expenditure over time, exactly like you always did. Reinstatement costs, though, are where you put like dividers into a place and then at the end, you've got to rip them all out and leave it exactly like it was. That cost, you will estimate the net present value of what it will be at the end of the lease and include it in the right of use asset now. And then finally, to get to your right of use asset, you take off any lease incentives. So rent-free period, or if they put a you know, lift into the building for you especially or something like that, you take the value of that off here and the debit will either be to the uh, uh, statement of net expenditure, if that's appropriate, or the statement of financial position, if it's a capital thing. And now we have our right of use asset, our completely nonsense asset on the balance sheet. But is it a nonsense, really? Because when you're occupying a building or using a photocopier, do you care whether it's actually rented or owned? You still get all the same benefit out of it, right? So, moving on. Just mentioned at the very beginning, there are two special exemptions that are available. One of them is for short-term leases. So if you've got a lease that's less than 12 months, or there's less than 12 months to run when you convert over to RFS 16, you just write them off to um, revenue as normal. So they would go in the statement of net expenditure. You don't have to capitalise them. Um, you can see there's a few conditions on it there. And then you also have this low value um, uh, exemption. Now, this is really weird because it is the only place in the whole of accounting standards, well, certainly UK GAAP and RFS that I know about, where a figure is quoted for what low value means. And it specifically is less than uh, 5,000 US dollars, um, which is nearer to pounds than it used to be, um, at least at the moment. Um, but this is an absolute thing. Even if the entity has turnover of hundreds of millions, 
it doesn't matter, you still have this level is your low value. And it's the value of the asset when it's new, not the value of the asset as it is now. So if it's five years old, you've got to look back and say, what was it worth at the beginning? And if an asset is worth less than 5,000 US dollars when new, you don't have to capitalise it in the way we were just talking about. You just write the payments off uh, to revenue in the way that you normally would. Um, and the kind of thing, as you can see here, my little lady on my screen is saying, you know, office furniture, phones, personal computers, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's it for the general requirements on um, leases under IFS 16. Now what we're going to do is have a look at the public sector in particular. So before we go into the special requirements of IFS 16 for the public sector, I think it's just worth reminding ourselves how you actually have to account for property, plant and equipment. Um, this is governed by the FREM, which is the Government Financial Reporting Manual, unless you're a kind of NHS type body, in which case it's governed by the GAM, the Group Accounting Manual for the NHS. But they're basically very similar, actually. The Group Accounting Manual's got a bit more detail in it. It's quite useful. Um, and it's really complicated, honestly. Um, you can see on the screen there the, the main requirements. And if I just recap them really briefly, because I could spend the whole 20 minutes talking about this if I wasn't careful. Um, Non-specialised assets that are used for their service potential, which is basically most assets, right, are recognised at current value in existing use. Now, that term has quite a complicated uh, description, but fundamentally it's a bit like market value. So most assets are at kind of market value on the face of it. But then you have this short-lived and, and or low value kind of concession, which is not the same as the short life and low value thing we were talking about under IFRS 16, right? This is a FREM one. And what this says is if you've got an asset that has a short life and or a low value, you don't have to use current value in existing use. You can use depreciated historical cost as a proxy for current value in existing use. Now, you know, what does it actually mean? Well, the FREM's not massively helpful on it, but there is some extra guidance that sits out there that's been produced by some very helpful people that explains to us that the kind of thing that's envisaged here is motor vehicles, um, you know, small bits of IT equipment like a, a laptop or, 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 or a tablet or a phone even, um, and maybe office equipment, you know, office uh, furniture and so on. And so most public sector bodies actually use depreciated historical costs for most assets because they're the main things they buy. Clearly, if you've got a specialised asset um, held for its service potential, you'll, you'll never do that on uh, depreciated historical costs. You'll be using, well, I can't even say it, this DRC MEA, <laughs> that one. I, you, know, you need to reference the, the valuation Rick's Red Book in order to know how to do all of that. But fundamentally, most things will be at depreciated historical cost. But that is at as a sort of concession. Now, remembering that all other assets are at fair value per IFRS 13. So that's our backdrop. We're really meant to be at current value and existing use for normal assets. And then what we find is we very helpfully got some guidance from the Department of Health and Social Care on how you will apply this to IFRS 16. And fundamentally, it's kind of the same, except that you've got this uh, low value and short term recognition exemption, which is a different one to the short life low value one that you have in the frame, just to be really confusing. So this one that you have to apply first, and by the way, this is literally taken out of some uh, uh, DHSC guidance, um, is you start by saying, can we take those exemptions, uh, the low value or short term recognition? If you can, great, you write it off to the statement of net expenditure. If you can't, you then go on to ask yourself whether you can use this proxy depreciated historic cost, uh, the kind I was talking about just now. So is it, you know, office equipment? Is it small computers? Is it motor vehicles? If so, that's what you will do for the right of use asset, just the same as you would for the normal asset. So you're in your historic cost, which is great. If not, you're then into revaluation requirements and it gets mega complicated. And I've got some stuff on the screen there. I'm not going to bore you with it right now. But basically, you know, all the stuff that you normally have to do to value your more complicated assets. If you rent them, 
you don't get out of doing all of that because you do it for the right of use asset. After, obviously, you, you've done your initial recognition in accordance with the first bit of my talk, but then after that, you have to revalue them. Sorry about that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at a bit of bad news, some kind of neutral news, and then some good news. And I'd like to finish, or at least finish this section, because it won't be the finish of the whole talk, with the good news, so I leave you with a smile on your face. Right? So we're going to start off with what is theoretically the worst news, and that is that under the FREM, IFRS 16's choice of being allowed to use cost or the revaluation model for the right of use asset is taken away. You're not allowed to use cost. However, as we've just seen, there is this kind of get out where by concession you can use depreciated historic costs. So actually, although it's removed, it's really only the larger and specialist assets where you're going to have a problem and have to go to the revaluation basis. So although it's the worst bad news, there's a way out. OK, second, we then have peppercorn leases. Now, probably most of you know what a peppercorn lease is, but just in case you don't, it's a lease where no money is paid in order to have that asset. I've only ever seen it apply to buildings, don't know if it applies to anything else. And the, the reason it's called peppercorn is because you give one peppercorn, you know, a tiny thing of no value each year under the lease in order to have occupy the premises. Now, in the past, you wouldn't have recognised that in your accounts at all. You might have had a note about it. And it's quite common in the public sector to have a uh, free premises, for example, that the government has given you, but with a peppercorn lease, so at least there's some conditions there. Now, you will have to recognise that lease in the same way as a charity would recognise donated assets or donated facilities. So what I mean by that is you're going to go debit the right of use asset with a figure that is the market value or fair value of that, of that lease and the credit will be income. It's like a, like a grant, basically. Um, and you didn't have to do that before. So that is bad news because it's a load of work to actually work out what would that lease really be worth. And you could argue you're just pumping up two sides of the uh, sector financial position. Is it worth it? Well, I think it is. But, well, not two sides, sorry, two sides of your account, one in the statement of financial position and one in the statement of net expenditure. But is it worth it? Well, yeah, because it's showing all the um, resources that you're using. And I think in this day and age, that's really important. Um, one more bit of it's kind of neutral news, bad stroke neutral news, which is that if you, your uh, premises that you're operating from is actually owned by Crown Estates, you're probably aware of that if it is, it may well not have a normal kind of lease on it at all. Crown Estates is the body in the UK, by the way, that um, looks after all of the properties that are theoretically owned by the monarch, but they're not literally owned by the Queen, it's whoever is the ruling monarch, and it passes from one to the other. Um, so whenever Charles eventually, hope it's a long time away, we have another 70 years of the Queen, I love her to bits, um, but you know, whenever she goes, it would be him in, in, in sort of notion or head of it. If you have one of those kind of leases, at the moment it's not counted as a proper lease. Um, unfortunately, the definition of a lease in the FREM does include those kind of Crown estate agreements, so it's bringing into scope some things that you might have thought were not in scope. And then finally, um, uh, I don't know if this is neutral or, or bad news. I think sometimes it, it's actually quite bad news. Um, all of the transitional provisions that are in IFRS 16, which give you all sorts of rights to do fun things when you're transferring across to IFRS 16 for the first time, are pretty much taken away. You can't do them. You just have to follow the way the friend says to do it. Now, in some cases, the way the friend says to do it is what the transitional provision says, as opposed to saying you don't use it, but you've got to do what they say, you have no options. That is what it is. That's the bad news. Now let's look at the good news. Um, the best good news of all, and believe me, private sector will be so jealous of you over this one, um, is that you are allowed to use the appropriate um, HM Treasury discount rate instead of having to try and work out what discount rate you're going to use. Now, gosh, that's going to save you a lot in accountancy fees because for the private sector, they had to really ask for advice on this. It's a really complicated thing to work out. So I thought that, I, honestly, I wish that the um, ISB had done something like that. And when they next update IFRS 16, I'm going to be telling them to do something like that for sure. 
uh, be interesting to see how it works for the public sector. Um, another uh, bit of really, we think, good news, although this is a matter of, of uh, how you regard it, is that the short-term lease exemption choice um, which a private sector would have, so this is the one where it's less than 12 months, you write it off the statement of net expenditure, that must be applied. But we think that's great because it means everybody's going to be doing the same thing if you've got very short, you know, if you rent a, an air conditioning unit in the summer when it's really hot in an office, not that there's any hint here that it might be really hot in this office right now. We couldn't have had an air conditioner, that would be too noisy. Um, you know, you would have to write that off. You wouldn't be allowed to capitalise it. And the last bit of positive news is that, um, in actual fact, we've got very much the same thing with the low value asset exemption, the, the under $5,000. You have to use it. You're not allowed to not apply it. I think that's good. Again, consistency. So there you go. That's how IFRS 16 applies to the public sector. And so there's only one more thing you want to know, and that's when does all this take effect? So let's start by just reminding ourselves how long has IFRS 16 been around? And it's incredible. It's actually been around since years commencing, on or after 1st of January 19. And I, you know, I find that unbelievable, actually. Um, but that's how long it's been around. Um, for the public sector, we've got two different rules. For all uh, entities that use the FREM, so that's the General Government Financial Reporting Manual, it's applying from years commencing on after 1st of April 2022, i.e., you know, three months ago, two months ago, whatever it is. Um, you've then also got the same thing applies for uh, NHS bodies who are applying the GAM. Um, it's the same date, um, but they just put it slightly differently. They say uh, they will incorporate the principles in their 2022-23 edition, but it comes back to the same, years commencing on after 1st of April 2022. The only ones who've got any leeway here is local government and local authorities who've had it knocked back another two years, in actual fact, to 1st of April 2024. Um, so they've got a bit longer before they have to worry about it. They are allowed to adopt it early if they were originally intending to, because in fact that rule has only just come in very recently. Um, I know we were talking about this earlier. Did yes, you, I was just have... thinking, do you have any idea of what the consequences would be if you fail to comply with IFR 16 by, well, <coughs> 1st of April is all the past, but you know, going forward, do you have any idea of what, what the consequences are? Yeah, I think if well, you got to the end of your financial year and you still hadn't adopted it, I mean, I think people might not know if you hadn't done it during the year, mm. but by the time you get to the end of the financial year, if you hadn't adopted it, I'm very sure that the National Audit Office would have something very serious to say about it. They would no doubt have to qualify your accounts, um, and that could have all sorts of implications for your funding, for example, mm. um, which, if you get a qualification in your accounts, might be withdrawn. Um, I don't know, it depends on your own individual uh, agreements, but it could have some very serious consequences. So this isn't a nice to have, this is a must do. Yeah. Hey, you've got years on the private sector anyway, so why not? Exactly, and you have a discount rate already set. So Absolutely, yes. it's a lot easier. Huh? Yeah. You've got it really easy. Mind you, they do have those PPE rules, which are horrible, by the That's way. True. That's true. Um, seriously, um, yeah, you've got to do it, but help is at hand. Um, so... Here we go. Um, what could we actually do to help you? Well, certainly at RSM, um, we've helped a lot of private sector businesses and actually some early adopters on the public sector as well with their IFRS 16 compliance. And the first thing that we can do is look for all the leases that you have, be they equipment leases, car leases, property leases, whatever, and pull out all the relevant data that is required. And there's a lot of it required, by the way, um, in order to do the accounting entries properly. That would be the first thing we'd do. Mm. And what about you? Yeah, and then with that, what you're saying is basically, we recommend um, starting working with the practice with the contracts as soon as possible, because um, one thing is getting that information one time, but yeah. I mean, having to do that over and over again, that's, that takes time. So we always recommend uh, just get compliant and then work with the contracts practically to stay okay. compliant as well. Perfect. That's a really good idea, staying on top of it. And of course, another way of staying on top of it is to look at, with all those horrible, you know, current value and existing use and everything else, technical requirements, mm -hmm. what we could do is help you to decide how you should be measuring your assets going forward, or even as you recognise them, as you say, it's really mm -hmm. important to do it in a timely way. So that's another way that RSM could feed in. 
for right. sure. And that's when you get to, I mean, having a, solution, a software solution that helps you with it. So uh, using complete control is how to quick them out after, afterwards. Uh, you can basically give the responsibility to the people that know the contract the best. Right. So rather than the financing working, you know, trying to get information on all the leases that you might have, uh, give the responsibility to the person that actually you know, is in charge of renting the office or the cars, and he right. or she can update the contracts and you can extract the data when you need it. That's such a good idea. I love that. Um, well, actually, that feeds in very well to, to, to my last point of what RSM might do, because what we can do is we can put together a report where actually we would go around and talk to all those people you're, t you're talking about of what the impact of RFS 16 has been on the entity as a whole, which you can then give to your management board or your trustees or whoever you have in governance over uh, the entity so that they can see what the impact has been. But we'd be talking to those people you're talking about in order to get that, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah, 100%. And the final thing about using a solution is that, well, yeah. one thing is of course being compliant with RFS 16 and then getting that data out. But when you have a solution like, like ours or anything else, you can always then also get you know other uh, benefits such as you know not going over contracts uh, deadlines, uh, notifications can be sent out. You can control of the contract itself. So that's a, a side bonus, I would say, to oh. being you know compliant with RFS 16 in a solution. I just had a thought. The, the things like when you've got an, a, a, an optional lease extension coming up, yeah. you'd be notified about it, and exactly. you'd know it's happening. Got you. Fantastic. And you can also get the value of that option. It, it's easier to work in a solution rather than having to you know reinvent the wheel every time you Think do it all RFS for yourself. 16. Yeah. Right. I mean, which you know. We weren't necessarily going to say this out loud, but I think I do have to say our, our point at the top there that you know you have actually got a fantastic IT solution that could help with this. I mean, you guessed, didn't you? He has, you know, and 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 I think that you're going to talk about that in, in more detail in a minute, aren't you? Yes, I was hoping I could show you the solution just a quick to see what what, what it looks like. Uh, but I mean, with that, it's also important for us to say that uh, yes, we have a technical solution and also some know-how on how to implement IFRS 16, but it's also, I mean, for us to be able to work with you and RSM, uh, you know, make the best solution possible with your uh, experience and all the knowledge in IFRS 16 and with the solution that we offer, I think it's the best way to go live with IFRS 16. Really great. Okay, well, I think I should hand over to you to do yeah. what you're going to do now. All right, so let's take a quick look at the solution just to show what you can be working with IFRS 16 with. Um, so this is uh, CC Fiber Complete Control 5 uh, with a lease accounting software uh, module added into it. So what we basically do when we implement new clients, uh, we always start by mirroring the organizational structure here. So I made now three companies within the group um, and it's nice to know that you can lock each specific company. So once you're done reporting, you can always make sure that no one else can change the numbers. And you can also change or add uh, departments like I've done here. Um, and also create a location structure. So uh, whenever the client has any requests in terms of setting up the base, we're always happy to help and then uh, customize and make sure that they get the best value out of the solution. Um, looking to contracts here, you can see that I have um, a portfolio of contracts within my solution. And just quick on, you can see that there's a thing uh, blinking here, the event list, and that's from this leasing car. And we talked about that already with how uh, it's always nice to you know, stay ahead uh, and know what's coming. So I can see that this car is about to expire if it hasn't already. So uh, yeah, it's about to expire this month. Uh, so I can then go in here and make change to the contract or just change the state. Um, and based on this uh, termination deadline, you can see that uh, James here will receive notification and he will make the necessary mm -hmm. updates. So that's what I was talking about in terms of um, handing out responsibility to the correct person. So that James here might not be a finance guy, but he knows everything that he needs to know about this car. Uh, and since you can lock periods and lock uh, RFS 16, you don't need to worry about the thing changing when you don't want it to change. Um, in addition to that, of course, uh, we can uh, create new contracts either here, we can import data, uh, and we, of course, have all the uh, reports necessary to be compliant with RFS 16, uh, either via normal just uh, reports in the system, Excel and APIs as well. So you can set it up to other solutions. Um, I just want to quickly go to the files here because you see I have four, um, uh, well, four files waiting for me. So in the inbox, I'm now waiting for um, Christopher and Gregory, my colleagues, has sent some contracts into the solution. So uh, getting the data into Complete Control is of course one of the most important things to do when you go uh, with RFS 16. And that's why we made this uh, functionality here to basically send documents straight into the solution. And uh, from here on, I can create the contract 
um, with suggestions made from the solution. So it will now help me to fill in the title and also to finding the dates. Uh, I quite see quite often that it's, it's a challenge to read through huge documents, finding the key Absolutely. data, um, yeah. especially dates. Uh, but the, this solution will help you insert the start date, it will find expiration date, etc. So Conva Capture is a part of Firefly Sixteen that is often forgotten about. Yes, but it's ne definitely something that you should focus on when you go live with Firefly Sixteen. It's the most time-consuming part at the beginning, without any doubt. It is. So you can basically just fill in here, and the system will help you. Um, That's brilliant. Get the data in. Um, and final thing I want to talk about is that we have a people section here. So we normally set it up so uh, the people that work with Firefly Sixteen, also the content managers, they have access to the solution. But it's also easy to give reading access to the auditors. So when so they can't mess with it, right? Exactly. <laughs> they can go in and read the documents and see That's that right. the system is compliant with what the document says. Uh, and then from there on, they can make the tests they want to do. Um, rather than having an auditor recreate an Excel sheet that you built last year, you forgot how that was, and then you know, redoing that work. Having a solution like this, you can just log in, check the data, and from there on. Um, That's great. Yeah. I think the National Audit Officers will like that. <laughs> we think so too, so that's why we're showing this. And that's everything we had planned to show you here today. Thank you so much, Danielle, for joining us on this webinar today. It's been my pleasure. Uh, you'll find our uh, contact information on the final slide after this webinar. Uh, once again, thank you so much for watching. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye from me.